Please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of Scripture that we read just a moment ago. And while you're turning, uh, let me just make a couple of announcements. This morning, as I came over early to turn on the air conditioning, which isn't real cool, but at least it's there, uh, walked across the parking lot and I found this pair of glasses. Uh, they're called OT Specs. And uh, obviously there are some kind of specialty glasses, little teeny weeny glasses. They were out in our parking lot. So if these are yours, please come up and pick them up after the service today. Then the second announcement that I want to make, I hope you noticed as you were walking in the door this morning, the new track rack that is by the door there. And if you stopped and looked at some of the tracks that were in it, this past week I've been busy with tracking. We've got some brand new tracks. Now here's one with a picture of Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton on the front of it called Who America Needs. <laughs> and um, those are there by the door. There's a little sign posted as you walk out this morning. I hope you read the sign. It says, warning, you are entering the mission field. Please take a tract and give it to somebody who doesn't know Jesus. I put that tract rack there this week so that you yourself can personally be involved. Now don't take a big stack of them and hope you'll pass them out someday. I'm just asking that you will take one, just one, and give it to somebody this week. And if you haven't done it by next week, don't take another one. But next week, if you actually gave it to one person, you can take two and see if you can pass out two during the week. You know somebody who doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ. So I encourage you to do that. You'll see that there are oh, probably seven or eight different tracks uh, that are in that track track, and you can choose the ones that you like best. Be sure you always read the tracks before you hand them out because if somebody asks you a question that is raised by the track and you don't know the answer you'll feel kind of funny so make sure you read the track before you pass it out this week I was also very busy um, renovating the track racks in the lobby and I hope that you will stop and look at those as well we've got many 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 new tracks on our pro-life table which is you go out this door here it's right in that little hallway like here's one, you know, people ask you, well, how about abortion for the cases of rape and incest? Okay, here's one on incest. Here's one on rape. Here's one on why condoms aren't safe. And there are many, many more out there. If you know somebody who needs to read one of those, feel free to stop by and pick up what's necessary. Dear people, a baby is a baby from the moment of conception. A child made in the image of God. All they have to do is grow. It's not merely fetal matter. It's a child. If you know somebody who needs that help, please try to rescue the baby. Then we have a track track. Oh, and by the way, I should mention there's some bumper stickers if you want bumper stickers like God is pro-life. There are several bump different kinds of bumper stickers on that table as well. Then we have some issues tables. This table over here in the lobby has got a bunch of different tracks with different issues. Like, for example, here's one I think you'll find interesting. Did Jesus wear long hair? Then we've got in that big, huge track rack, you can see I've been hunting all over the church the last week to find all the tracks that have been in boxes and locked in cabinets. You wouldn't believe how many hundred different tracks I found locked in cabinets that nobody had keys to. I actually had to break open some locks to get to them because I was pretty sure that would be what was in there. I broke them the locks. I replaced the locks too, by the way, uh, with locks that now have keys that the trustees and elders will have. But uh, like here's one, famous final words of famous men. Man, that's a great tract. Or we have many of those on that table over there. Then we have a table that deals with uh, other religions and cults like that's that table over there, closer to the women's room, underneath the big plaque where Dr. McIntyre is. Here's one. A modern Jew looks at Jesus Christ. Here's one about true witnesses to Jehovah. Bible verses for Roman Catholics. Religion or salvation, Eastern religions. Many, many different tracts. I encourage you. Do you know somebody who needs a tract, who needs to hear the gospel? Bible verses that are specifically tailored to help answer their specific questions. I encourage you. Stop by and pick up one of those tracks and give it to the person. Okay, now let's take our Bibles 
And let's turn over to the book of Exodus. We're in chapter 14. We're looking at verses 1 through 9 today. This is part 3 of Mouth of the Gorges. Not gorging with your mouth, but Mouth of the Gorges. We just read that a moment ago. Last week, as you know, I passed out copies of a wrong map found in most standard Bibles. In fact, I photocopied it right out of the back of this Bible here. It has lots of beautiful maps in it. You know, this, this Bible has really some really beautiful maps, full color maps. It's the Bible that I use to preach out of. But the map is wrong. And we went over those maps looking for things that would somehow point to what we have in our text. We noticed that there were a number of place names that were here in chapter 14, verse 2. It so said, Speak unto the children of Israel that they turn and encamp before Pihahirot, between Migdal and the sea, over against Baal Siphon, before ye shall encamp by the sea. Well, right off the bat, as you look at that map, and some of you may have brought your maps back this week, I hope you did. Um, but anyway, if you look at that map, you'll see that all of the places that are listed along the route None of them have anything to do with the sea. None of them. I mean, they got the Great Bitter Lake, they got Lake Timsa, they got the Little Bitter Lake, they've got swamp marshes. But God told them to go and encamp by the sea. In fact, he says it twice in the same verse. And the sea is nowhere in view anywhere on those maps except way, 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 way far down to the south. You know, the, the liberals like to have you think, well, what it means is it wasn't the Red Sea, it was the Reed Sea. Because after all, it's the, it says, the word used is a word that's used for borders. And so papyrus plants grow along the borders of marshes. And so therefore it must mean the Reed Sea because it must be referring to papyrus plants. Folks, that's a stretch. But if you read a bunch of the liberal commentaries written starting back in the late 1800s, that's what they come to the conclusion. And everybody has bought their maps. You get good fundamental Bibles and they've all got their maps in it. You get big Bibles that have all kinds of footnotes and stuff and all the fundamentalists use them. And boy, they got great commentaries. And, all this, and they got those crummy liberal maps in the back. At least that's a crummy liberal map. Some of the other ones are good. Why do we buy it? It's not what the text said. Turn in and camp before Pihahirot, and we talk about what they mean in just a moment, Migdal and the sea, and over against Baal Siphon, before ye shall encamp by the sea. We also notice place names in the immediate preceding passage, where we spent a lot of time, that was back in Exodus 13, and they took their journey from Sukkot and encamped at Itham in the edge of the wilderness. Where you gotta be is you gotta be by the sea in the edge of the wilderness. You gotta have some wilderness there. Up there in the north, you've got all kinds of stuff besides wilderness. Then we learn the meaning of the names to help solve the mystery of exactly where the crossing of the Red Sea took place. And also to try to help resolve the enigmatic statement of the Apostle Paul as to the location of the real Mount Sinai. Remember, Paul said in Galatians chapter 4, verses 24 and 25, which things are an allegory, for these are the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth unto bondage, which is Agar, he's talking about the law, for this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. The Sinai Peninsula has never been part of Arabia in all of its history, as far as I could ever find anywhere. So you can't say it's in the Sinai Peninsula that was part of Arabia, because that was not part of Arabia. And answer it to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. So Paul says specifically the Mount Sinai is in Arabia. So that should tell us something about the location of Goshen and the location of Pharaoh at this time of history when the Exodus took place. And that should tell us something about the root of the Exodus. It should tell us about something about the immense miracle that took place at the crossing of the Red Sea. I think it's the greatest miracle in the Old Testament. And yes, probably, maybe, uh, I'm sure. Okay, creation is a greater miracle. Noah's flood is using natural causes, but we have a miracle here. The parting of water where the walls are standing up on each side, the height of city walls. We'll talk about that when we get later in the text. That's a miracle. 
and the ground under their feet is not wet, it's dry, it's not mud, it's dry. It says so. That's a miracle. We noted that in both ancient and modern times, place names often describe the character, the nature, and the location of the place. And we saw the translation of those three names. Pihahirot means mouth of the gorges, plural. Mouth of the gorges. Migdal means tower. Baatsafon means master or lord of the north. We looked at the descriptive words to try to make sense of them. It says before Pihahirot between Migdal and the sea, over against Baal Tzaphon. Before it, ye shall encamp. Now last week, all of you all failed miserably, because I gave you an assignment the week before to look at an ancient Bible map to see if you could make any sense about the root of the Exodus in light of those place names that the text specifically says and emphasizes repeatedly that that is where they had to go and that is where Pharaoh caught them. And nobody raised a hand when I asked who had tried. Later some people said, well, they had tried, but they were af afraid that I would call on them and make them say something. Well, hey, if you don't raise your hand when I call for it, you don't pass the test, you don't get books. I had some very nice books worth 10 bucks a piece that I was going to give to you all. I had a whole stack of them here, remember? But nobody raised a hand. That set the stage for today. I gave you a wrong map last week. Today I'm going to give you a correct map. But I gave you that wrong map so you'd understand what we're talking about. And I hope if we can keep on track and if we can do it in time, I'll give you the real map of what's going on. So here are the things that we saw that were wrong with the map last week. You've got to keep it in mind so that you'll understand when you see the good map. Number one, the map, the bad map, showing the route of the Exodus puts the land of Goshen up in the Nile Delta region, slightly to the east of the two main discharge areas of the river. Everybody thinks Goshen is in the delta because it was good land where Pharaoh put the children of Israel back in the days of Joseph. And so they assume it's got to be the delta. Folks, the Nile floods every year and there are crops and good land all up and down the Nile River. If that's the only thing you go on, you can't make anything else in the text fit. And certainly not the dates of the Exodus. Number two, the same map, that bad map, showed the city of Ramses in the northern part of the area. And they say, well, the, the Jews built Python and Ramses, so here's Ramses. This must be the Ramses that the Bible's talking about. But that city was built by Ramses II around 1290 B.C., far too late for the biblical date of the Exodus. We'll see why. We'll, we'll look and find the right date of the Exodus date because the, the Bible tells you exactly when the Exodus was from points in time that you can measure. 1290 is the date set by the liberals because they have to avoid having a genuine miracle in crossing the Red Sea. You'll see why in a minute. Some of your Bible maps, and you were looking at both at your Bibles, and that little map that I gave you showed Python and Sukkot a little to the southeast of Ramses in the area of Lake Timsa, the Great Bitter Lakes, the Little Bitter Lake, an area of swampy marshes and papyrus plants. The bad map showed the Israelites crossing into what is known today as the Sinai Peninsula through the marshy areas over the top of the Gulf of Suez and heading what direction? Heading south. Heading south. There's some indicators in our text that says they did not head south. And yet that's what every one of those crazy maps says, that they're heading south. It shows them wading through the mud and going around the top of the Gulf of, uh, of Suez so that they can get into the Sinai Peninsula. We pointed out that all the stopping points marked on the bad map were the names of places that the Bible says the children of Israel visited, stopped, or passed by. But we also noticed that all of those place names had a question mark by them. Now, archaeologists have been in the Sinai Peninsula and they've been looking for the places that Israel stopped and they can't find them. And so that's why all those question marks on your maps. You know, the reason for the question marks is because the map makers were just taking a guess and they really based their guesses on the assumptions of the liberal theologians who hated the idea of a real miracle taking place in the text. We also noticed that the southern bend of the Mediterranean Bible, uh, a Mediterranean Sea, many Bible maps show a little line marked Wadi al Arish. And if you read anything about this discussion, and man, we went through all this kind of discussion in college. I was a 
Bible and history major in college and then a Greek major and a Hebrew major in seminary. And I took all the classes. And, you know, you wouldn't believe the stuff that's been written about the Wadi El Arish being the river of Egypt. Now, what idiot, when he thinks of Egypt, thinks of the Wadi El Arish as the river of Egypt? I mean, if you ask anybody on the street today, what is the river of Egypt? The river of Egypt, what would they tell you? The Nile! The Nile River. A wadi is a seasonal river. It's a dry riverbed most of the year, and the only time it fills with water and floods, and it becomes very dangerous, by the way, at that time, the only time that it floods is when there are heavy rains up in the mountains, and then suddenly there's this gush, torrential gush of water that comes rushing down, you know, and dumps into the ocean, and then after a few days, it's empty again. To call that the river of Egypt is really a stretch of the imagination, and yet even conservatives have bought into that. It, it, it pains me to read some of the commentaries on this. Anyway, but you see, they, they have to make that the river of Egypt because the, the Bible ties the Nile River, the real river of Egypt, to the Exodus. But the Wadi El Ariz suits fine if you want to deny the miracles of the Exodus. We also notice various indicators on the Bab map, map showing the wilderness of Shur, the wilderness of Zin, the wilderness of Paran, Midian, Edom, Moab, and some of those are correct, but some of them should have a question mark by them. We also saw that the Bab map put Mount Sinai down near the bottom, the southern end of the Sinai Peninsula. And some also have the words to the effect, and this is more to the point, traditional location. <laughs> yeah, there, there's a tradition. And there's a Greek Orthodox monastery down there, St. Catherine's Monastery, uh, where somebody thought at one point that, hey, this, this must be the mountain of Moses, a Jebel Musa, which is Arabic for mountain of Moses. We also notice that when the route reached the map, on the map reached Etzion Geber, the question marks disappear. There were no question marks at Kadesh Barnea. And the reason for that is because those are sites that are archaeological sites that are well excavated, have been definitely identified, and you have no question about them. But they are all up north east of Sinai. And an area can be reached either by Arabia or by Sinai. Then we challenge you to try to figure out what Paul was talking about when he talked about Mount Sinai being in Arabia. That meant that we had to look at a map to f figure out where Arabia is in relation to most of the coastline of Egypt. Did you know that most of the coastline of Egypt parallels, not the Sinai Peninsula, it parallels Arabia. Most of the coastline of Egypt parallels Arabia. And we have to remember, don't ever forget this, remember the Israelites crossed a body of water to get to Mount Sinai, and the Egyptians trying to cross didn't get stuck in the mud, they got drowned. And the sea washed their bodies up the next day. Mud doesn't drown you unless you get stepped on by your horse and pushes you under. And the mud certainly doesn't wash up on the following day on the far shore. That means we have to look at the coastline of Egypt. The coastline of Egypt, not the swamp marshes near the Nile Delta. And then we ask another question. Have you ever wondered how at least six million people could wander around in the Sinai Peninsula? I know a lot of people say two million. Listen, they didn't have 1.8 kids back then, like everybody does here in America today. I think it's gone down to 1.6 now. I mean, they were having as many babies as they could. Pharaoh was trying to kill off their kids. There are at least 6 million of them wandering around. How could they, 6 million people, wander around in the Sinai Peninsula for 40 years and never leave a trace of having been there? Certainly, if they'd been there for 40 years, they would have left some kind of a trace. You know, there are no traces of them down there. That's what confuses the archaeologists, why they put question marks next to all the place names on your maps in your Bibles. But there were people that lived there. We're going to talk about who they were, and today, the Lord willing. There were people who lived on the western coastline of the Sinai Peninsula. 
We do have traces of those people. In fact, we even have inscriptions by those people. In fact, we even have graffiti by some of those people. You know, sort of like the sign during World War II that showed the guy with the big nose hanging over the fence and his fingers hanging over the fence and it said Kilroy was here. We got stuff like that. People have had that kind of personalities all the way back then. So we know exactly who lived there. We know exactly when they lived there. We know exactly what was going on. We know who was controlling that area at the time of the Exodus. Not a question. But today I want to look at some other passages in the Bible that tell us the exact date of the Exodus. That'll help remind us uh, that God really does do miracles. And it will help us to determine which archaeological remains to examine to determine who was the Pharaoh at that time, and more importantly, where his seat of government was located. Because Moses was making, remember this, remember when we were going through the plagues, Moses was making daily trips between the Jews and Pharaoh all the time the ten plagues were in progress. Back and forth between Pharaoh and the Jews, every day. You see, if you go down to 1290, which is the liberal state for the Exodus, you got the capital of Egypt up near the Nile Delta. And that fits the liberals just fine because that way they can have Moses going back and forth every day. They call Delta the Delta land of Goshen. They call, you know, Ramses up there, the capital where where Pharaoh was sitting, Ramses II, and that's 1290. And we can Egyptology is very precise on its dates. I mean, they've made inscriptions all over the place in stone. They've lasted. We can read them now. Histon, the Histon inscription uh, enabled that. They don't want a miracle. So we'll have to find out where was the seat of e Egypt, uh, the capital, the government, at the time of Exodus, and that means we have to determine the time of the Exodus. So, the big question. Pihahirot, mouth of the gorges, Migdal, tower, Baal Tsephon, master of the north. And the reason you couldn't find any of those on any of the maps was because they're not only not on your map, they're not there on the ground. There's no topographical features anywhere in the area that would match up. There are no gorges. It says mouth of the gorges. There are no towers like mountains. And the root, it says Baal Tsephon, master of the north. The root is going south on those silly maps, not north. It doesn't fit. So let's ask take those questions one at a time, see if we can answer at least most of them from the Bible with archaeology and secular history demonstrating the truth of Scripture. The first issue to deal with is the date of the Exodus. The Bible gives several clear indicators as to the date of the Exodus. I'm not going to give you all the different passages because there are a lot of different ways that you can figure this out. Many different ways. I'm going to give you the key ones. I mentioned last week that according to Second Chronicles, the temple was completed in the 11th year of Solomon's reign that it took 7.5 years to build, and depending on several other indicators in the text, that puts us between 966 B.C. and 950 B.C. for the building of Solomon's temple. But the Bible lets us narrow it down even more than that. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to read these verses along with me. The first one we're going to look at is 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1. Now I'm going to try to make this very simple. I mean, scholars have fought over this for years and years and years and years, but there are certain Bible verses that make things very plain, and those are the ones we're going to try to look at. So, let's look at the passages that pinpoint the date of the Exodus. The first clue is in 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 1. And it came to pass, in the 480th year, after the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month Ziph, which is the second month, that he began to build the house of the Lord. So we're four years into Solomon's reign, and at that point he starts to build the temple. And so you can back from that point 480 years, and that will give you the date of the Exodus. That's our first clue. Now, there are many different ways to demonstrate that Solomon's reign began, or the fourth year began to be, between 967 at the earliest and 961 B.C. at the latest. You remember, time goes backwards. You count backwards when you're B.C. When you add 480 years to that, it means the Exodus was somewhere between 447 B.C. 
and 441 BC. 447 is farther away, 441 is closer. So the first clue that we have is we've at least narrowed it down to a range of about six year period where it could take place. That puts us in the right period of Egyptian history because we're going to compare to try to figure out who Pharaoh was at this time and where was his capital. 447 down to 441. Oh, sorry, 14. I can't read my own notes. 1447. <laughs> Thank you, Keith. I'm looking at it. I know the date. <laughs> uh, trying to make it simple. That's way too simple. Accordingly, the, adding 480 years to that means the Exodus took place between 1447 and 1441 BC. Now, I'll just tell you my, my personal choice, my conviction after looking at lots of other passages. I think it took place in 1445 BC, with entrance into the land in 1401 BC. But anyway, that's, to figure that out, you have to backdate from the book of Daniel and the book of Judges and the books of the monarchy and several other factors. But for our current purposes, the range is between 1447 and 1441. That puts us in the right period of Egyptian history. The second thing, the second clue, we find that Solomon reigned for a total of 40 years, according to scripture. That's 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 42. 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 42, if you're following along. That verse says, and the time that Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel was 40 years. That's our second clue. The third clue that we have in scripture is we know that the Jews were in Egypt from the days of Jacob entering into Egypt, that the Jews were in Egypt exactly 430 years to the day, from the day that Jacob entered Egypt until the day that they left Egypt, because it says so. Here's our third clue. This is in Exodus chapter 12, verses 40 and 41. Now the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. And it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, even the self same day it came to pass, that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. Now, do you think God is giving us some precise details here? We've got to put them together. But that's pretty, pretty detailed and precise, don't you think? So that means, so we'll just add a few surrounding events so that we'll know what we're talking about. That means that Jacob and his sons entered into Egypt sometime between 1877 B.C. and 1871 B.C. That's that six-year period. That puts Abraham about 2000 BC. If you mess that up, you've got Abraham coming in during the Hyksos period. And I'll talk about the Hyksos a little bit later on, which has all kinds of other problems of its own. Corresponding in biblical periods that can be proved independently. Let me give you some of the sideline ways that you can also get to the conclusions that I'm drawing here today. Additional passages of scripture can be shown to support the period of the judges. That runs from about 1400 BC to 1050 BC, the period of the judges. You know, we talked about Joshua and the children of Israel coming into the land, conquering the land and their various arguments about you know which layer of the tell of Jericho is the layer that Joshua conquered and all that kind of stuff and you've got the opinions of John Garstang and Kathleen Kenyon and you've got all kinds of fights about that we don't have to worry about that at this point I've got opinions on that as well but uh, but we we know when the period of the judges took place and it's from about 1400 BC down to about 1050 BC and then that's followed immediately by Saul the first king of Israel and then David, and then Solomon. And David, we can demonstrate, is just about 1000 BC. But the liberals try to truncate that period of the judges and make it only about 100 and 150 years long instead of 250 to 300 years long. But to do that, they have to ignore the entire chronology of that period and say that all the numbers are wrong for the period of the judges. And those are bending lots of different passages of scripture just so they can avoid the real exodus. And the, 
the, the text gives lots in, in the book of Kings, uh, lots of detailed chronology. We find real clear indicators and pointers in the book of Judges as to time periods and so on. Number nine, Egyptian history is well established during this period. That is the period around 1445 BC. That period is what's called the New Kingdom. This period in Egyptian history is called the New Kingdom. That kingdom begins with what's called the 18th dynasty. And you can look all this stuff up. Uh, you know, I, I got a lot of material out of the uh, World Book, Encyclopedia, lots of other Encyclopedia Britannica, lots of different places where, where you can find all this stuff about Egyptian history and you can check out everything I'm telling you today. But that period of history is what's called the New Kingdom, the 18th dynasty, and we know for sure who the pharaohs were during that period. Now, I'm not going to give you all the pharaohs in the 18th dynasty, just the ones that are the key pharaohs that relate to our text. I also want to talk about what gave rise, or probably gave rise, to the oppression of the Jews, because it says there was a pharaoh who arose that knew not Joseph. And that's when the, the oppression began, and then the bondage began, and then the killing of the babies began, and then Moses kills the Egyptian, he runs away into the wilderness for 40 years, and then he comes back again, then he challenges the pharaoh. There are several pharaohs that are involved during this period of time. Not the same Pharaoh who lived, he was an old guy who started out and lived another 80 years by the time Moses got back. There were several Pharaohs right at this point in history. Some of them only lived four years. I'll talk about that in just a second. Very short reigns of what happened during this period. But anyway, first, the historic event that raised the anti-Semitic feelings in Egypt. Now, the Jews had lived there for this real long period of time. They lived there over 400 years. And, uh, but suddenly, everybody turned anti-Jewish anti-Semitic. What was it? Well, I suspect, the text doesn't say this specifically, but this is what I suspect, that the invasion of Egypt by the Hyksos, that was a Semitic people from the north. Egypt, during the 18th dynasty, expanded a lot. They, they defeated the Nubians, they defeated other African nations that were around them, uh, and they also pressed north, all the way through the land of Canaan, uh, all the way up into the area where the Hittites were located, which is Turkey today, uh, the Egyptians really expanded their borders during the 18th dynasty, which is probably another of the reasons that God didn't allow them to go up into Israel immediately, not just because of the people of the land, but there's also a great deal of Egyptian activity that was going on at that time. But anyway, the Hyksos invaded Egypt and they were repulsed and finally driven out around 1570 when the 18th dynasty was established. So let me give you some of the rulers now. Here are some of the key rulers. Not everybody, but the key rulers who take us through this period of time. The first one is Tutmos I. T-H-U-T-M-O-S-E, the first. Now, I'm not going to give you how long they lived. I'm going to give you when they ruled. We can establish when they ruled. He ruled from about 1525 B.C. to 1508 B.C. from 1525 to 1508 BC. Moses was probably born under his reign. He had a teenage daughter at that time, and I suspect you've heard of her. Her name was Hashepsut. You've probably heard of Hashepsut, right? The most famous female ruler of Egypt. Moses was probably born about 1520, and Hashepsut, the daughter of Tutmos I, was probably the daughter of Pharaoh who found him in the bulrushes. And that story was recorded for us back in Exodus chapter 2, verses 5 through 10. The second Pharaoh, the one who followed him, was Tutmos II. T-H-U-T-M-O-S-E II. He ruled from 1508 to 1504. He only reigned for four years. But he was the son of Thutmose the first, obviously. He was the Pharaoh who started drowning babies. Guess who he married? He married his half sister Hashepsut. When he died after only four years, his half sister Hashepsut came to power, taking care of their son. 
Well, it wasn't her son. It was his son by a concubine. We'll talk about that in a moment. But taking care of his son, that was Thutmose III, as the regent for Thutmose III. Thus, Moses would have been raised by Hatshepsut with Moses as part of the same family group as Thutmose III. Now, things get a little kinky at this point. You've got to remember the Egyptian rulers didn't have any of the standards that God has, so the marriages were really weird and complex and somewhat kinky. So now we move down to Hatshepsut, who's the daughter of Thutmose I. She's ruling now from 1504 when Thutmose II dies down to 1483 BC. 1504 to 1483. When her husband, who is also her half-brother, died, and then she reigned as the regent for her nephew, Thutmose III, with full power as Pharaoh. She was not his mother. She was sort of like an aunt in that funny family structure. She was an excellent administrator and a peace-loving Pharaoh. She tried to build greatness into Egypt. Uh, she really was a very bright woman and everything you read that you can decipher from the monuments because a lot of her monuments have been destroyed I'll explain why in a moment uh, really point to that then we get down to Thutmose III after Hatshepsut Thutmose III he ruled from 8, 1482 to 1450 BC he was a son of Thutmose II remember who's married to Hatshepsut but of course, those rulers had lots of women. He was the son of Thutmose II by a concubine. And he was the sort of nephew of Hatshepsut. But the problem is, how is the son of a concubine going to you know, get raised up to the position of being Pharaoh of Egypt? He had to somehow legitimize his succession. So you know how he did it? He married the daughter of his aunt and regent, Hatshepsut. <laughs> I told you it gets kind of complex and kinky. And so as he was growing up, he was struggling with his aunt. He wanted to be the pharaoh. He was a very bright, very powerful young man. But he had to wait for 22 years until her death to be able to take the throne. She died in 1450, excuse me, uh, in 1483. When he died, you know what he did? To make sure that nobody remembered her? He tried to smash all of her statues. He tried to obliterate her name from all of the monuments. In front of the big things that she had built, he built other buildings so that people couldn't see her buildings. He was very powerful. He was very vicious. He won 17 major military campaigns, both south and west and north. He probably had envy for Moses, who was a Jew, but who was still in favor in the royal courts at this time because of Hatshepsut, who was the legal mother of Moses, and the aunt and mother-in-law, both aunt and mother-in-law at the same time, of Thutmose III. He was the Pharaoh from whom Moses fled after killing the Egyptian. So this is the guy that Moses is running away from when he kills the Egyptian. That brings us to the last guy, Amenhotep II. That's A-M-E-N, just like the word Amen. Then, like Santa Claus says, ho, 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 H-O, and then T-E-P. Amenhotep II. He ruled from 1450 BC to 1425 BC. Do you understand why I give you those note taking papers in your bulletins? Okay, he was the son of Thutmose III and his wife, who was the daughter of Hatshepsut. Amenhotep II is the Pharaoh of the Exodus. Amenhotep II is the Pharaoh of the Exodus. Now, why in the world have I spent so much time giving you Egyptian history? Why is it important? The reason it's important is because we know precisely where all the ruling pharaohs of this time, that is in the 18th dynasty in the New Kingdom, we know where they were located, where their capital was, where they lived. Where Moses would have had to go in to see them and then go back to see the Jews on the same day. They were ruling from Thebes just across the Nile River from Luxor and Karnak. And folks, that is 450 to 480 miles, depending on which point you measure to, 450 miles south of the delta of the Nile River. Now, I've made you some good maps. Could I have some help from a couple of the gentlemen to pass out the good maps?
And I've got two sides to it. This map is a simple side. This map has some pictures of Thebes, Luxor, and Karnak on it. You see, folks, Satan doesn't like the miraculous elements in the Bible. He wants you to think it's all a made-up story. He doesn't want you to think that the Jews are any special people in the eyes of God. That God had made promises to them in the past that he kept to the letter. That Joseph understood those promises, and that's why he said, when you leave, you carry my bones back with you and bury them in the land. And they did. And we talked about that in detail. And they carried them all the way through the warfare of Joshua, all the way until Joshua died, and then the bones of Joseph were finally buried. Because Joseph believed the precise promises of God. Okay, now most of you, I think, have got your maps. Okay, now, that's why I've gone to such trouble to establish the date of the Exodus, because it tells us precisely who the Pharaoh was at that time, and that tells us where Pharaoh was ruling. And the Pharaohs were ruling during this entire time at that giant bend in the river at Thebes and Luxor and Karnak, where all the great monuments are located. Thank you, Keith. That's the place that includes the Valley of the Kings, the great temples, even the unfinished tomb of Hatshepsut. 450 to 480 miles south of the Nile Delta region where the liberals want to put the land of Goshen so they don't have to admit that there is a real miracle in crossing a real sea, although the text emphasizes it over and over. You're to camp next to the sea between Baal Tzephon and Migdal at Pihahirot, the mouth of the gorges, and it's all flat up there. Apparently gorgeous. Moses is making daily trips between Pharaoh and the Jews, which means that Goshen was located in this area. The Egyptians had totally enslaved all non-Egyptian people at this time due to the anti-Semitic racism that had penetrated Egypt with the invasion and expulsion of the Semitic Hyksos people. That area has also historically been very fertile and fruitful, that big bend in the river there that you see on your map, since the Nile overflows its banks every year. Now, look at your maps for a second, the one that has the simple map on it the white side paper, you'll notice that there are two dotted lines leading from the Luxor Karnak area directly over to the Red Sea. Those are two ancient trade routes that go down to port areas on the sea. Now, somewhere in my boxes, you know, I moved here eight and a half years ago and I packed everything that I owned in boxes and it's still in boxes. I've never been able to unload the boxes. I only this last year got the big room up there and I'm in the process of trying to renovate that room so that I can somehow unpack all of my boxes of books. But somewhere in those boxes, years ago, it must have been back in the early 70s, I got a map of ancient Egypt from National Geographic. I subscribed to, I, didn't, I don't subscribe to anymore, it's more like National Pornographic instead of National Geographic. You got all these naked people running around, they'd say, well, it's art and it's cultural, and you know, that's what they do in these other countries. Forget it. I, I quit taking National Geographic. But before I quit taking National Geographic, I got this gigantic map, it's a huge map, I wish I could find it, of Egypt. And it shows these trade routes. I had to draw them in on this little tiny map here. It shows these two trade routes. And it shows the topographical features of that area of Egypt all the way over to the Red Sea. It's a fascinating map because it fits exactly with the text. And there are two, about halfway down each of those dotted lines, there are two ruined mud brick cities that have never been excavated. I posit that those are Python and Ramses, where the Jews in bondage were having to gather their own straw to make the mud bricks. And that's within distance of going between the Thebes, Karnak, Luxor area and back and forth to the elders of Israel each day. That means that when the children of Israel fled, they would already be halfway down that line going toward the sea and someone would have had to run back to Pharaoh all the way back to Thebes, Karnak and Luxor tell him what was happening and as they were still traveling they're all on foot he hasn't gotten to his chariot yet 
They would have gotten into their chairs back here at the area of Thebes and Karnak and Luxor. They'd gotten into their chairs and start running, but the Jews are almost already to the sea at that point. And they're camping. When Pharaoh finally, with the vastest thing available in his day, finally gets to them. And he's got them boxed in. Because he knows, the spy who has told him this, he knows the wilderness has entrapped them. Remember, the text says they're going to, supposed to go toward the edge of the wilderness. Everything fits in the text. Let's look at it a little bit farther. I hope I find that map someday. I'll show you that map if I ever can find it. I hope that someday somebody excavates those two massive abandoned mud brick cities. Now, the map that I have given you doesn't show it, but if you had a topographical map of the area, and you can look on the internet, I actually looked on the internet last night just to make sure what I was going to tell you was true. Um, if you look at the topographical map of the area, you'll see that those two routes go through two mountain passes or two gorges. And the Jews were supposed to camp on the other side of the mouth of the gorges as you read your text. And as you look at the ancient maps, you'll also notice there is a road that runs right along the edge of the Red Sea with a mountain range if you're going north, a mountain range on your left and the Red Sea on your right, or if you're going south, with a mountain range on your right and the Red Sea on your left. And the route going north, that would the mountain ranges I would consider to be Migdal, towers. The mountain range going north has a fortified Egyptian city just a little north of that northern route. It says they were to camp before Baal Tsephon, the Lord or the Master, the Controller of the North. I wish that city would get excavated. Probably not going to happen in our lifetimes, but I mean, because of all the crazy things that go on down there. I suspect that that's Baal Tsephon. There are Egyptian forces stationed there and unarmed Jews and it's a narrow pass. It's like sort of a, like at Thermopylae, you know, or down at Petra, down in Edom, where there's this narrow pass called the Sikh and a handful of men can defend against an invading army because the invading army all has to narrow down. And the handful of men who's guarding it is up high and they can throw down rocks on the invaders and here are the unarmed Jews they're boxed in and Pharaoh knows it and he is thrilled he says we're gonna go we're gonna teach them a lesson not knowing that God himself put them in that position to show the impossibility of human escape without divine help that's where I think the Exodus took place. Look, it's a long way south of the tip of the Sinai Peninsula. And it is Israel camping right next to the sea, like it says in our text twice. Not a swampy marsh, not just because there are border plants, papyrus. It is the border of Egypt, but it's the border of Egypt that's on the sea, and it is directly across the sea from Arabia. And to have a miracle at this part where the sea actually parts and when we get to that little farther in the text it talks about the water stood in walls on both sides of them I told you there are multiple kinds of words for walls in the Old Testament Hebrew words and that particular word for wall is a massive city wall it wasn't little mud splashing up on their ankles when they stepped in it they went across on dry ground people God is telling us that he performed a miracle a genuine 100 percent God designed God planned God executed miracle
to prove that he is God and to get glory over Pharaoh and all the gods of Egypt, which is what the ten plagues were all about. All the chief gods of Egypt were destroyed in the ten plagues of Egypt. And Pharaoh was the last god who claimed himself to be God and God was going to smash him too. That's the God that we serve. That's the God who not only loved Israel and still loves Israel, but the God who loves the church and made his own son the bridegroom for the heavenly bride, you and me. This is powerful stuff. Anyway, the reason that nobody can find the sites in the Bible where Israel camped is because everybody's been looking in the Sinai Peninsula where they ought to be looking is in Arabia. And they're not doing that. By the way, another important historical note, and I'm done, I'm 15 minutes over time. Another important historical note is this. At the time of the Exodus, the entire western side, remember I told you his people lived in the Sinai? That entire western side of the Sinai Peninsula, which all your maps show the route of the Exodus wandering down the western edge of the Sinai Peninsula. The entire western side of the Sinai Peninsula is filled with copper mines. Very valuable resource. It's filled with copper mines that were owned and operated by the Egyptian government. It was loaded with Egyptians. But if you read the text carefully, you'll discover that once Israel got across the Red Sea, the only Egyptians they ever saw from that point on were the dead ones that got washed up on the shore. They didn't keep running into Egyptian after Egyptian after Egyptian after Egyptian. They didn't have to fight the garrisons at all the different copper mines that are all along the western border of the, of the Sinai Peninsula. And those are the places that are so well documented archaeologically. We know who lived there because there are inscriptions all over the place. All along the western side of the Sinai Peninsula. But the Israelites never again had to fight Egyptians. The people groups that they encountered were all in the Arabian Peninsula and to the north, but not around the Horn of Sinai. We're told about different ones. They ran into the Midianites and all those later on. But none of those people lived down there on the western side of Sinai. Well, we're going to pick up there next week, the Lord willing. Some of you are probably asking, well, what about the chariot wheels that have been found in the Gulf of Aqaba? And we'll talk about that, the Lord willing, next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. We thank you that your word is true from the very first word. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was a form and void, and darkness covered the face of the deep. Father, how we thank you. Your word is true from beginning to end. There are no mistakes. Because you're the God who has designed all of history to bring you the greatest amount of glory and the greatest good for your people. Father, thank you that you loved us and sent Jesus to be our Redeemer to get us out of Egypt, out of the world, out from under the power of Pharaoh who represents Satan in Scripture and bring us into the lands of blessing and promise. Well, there's still war here on earth even as the Jews had to fight when they went into the land. But they were your people and you guided them all the way. Father, take your word and use it in our hearts, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Our closing hymn for today.